Good afternoon. It is my profound honor to call us all to order and welcome you all this afternoon as we begin this ceremony today to honor this great man, Honorable Justice Jai Ram Reddy. Today is indeed a somber occasion, but also one of deep reflection, Talanoa, from the hearts of those who journeyed with Mr. Reddy, and ultimately, as Mr. Reddy would want, with firm resolution in our hearts, minds, and hands that the vision and tireless toil for Fiji that is united together will be continued by every one of us, either seated here today or watching through live stream. I pause here to also offer our warmest respects and gratitude to the community and landowners of Lotoka for allowing us to gather here today to remember a son of Lotoka and the life so well and richly lived. So without any further delay, it is now my privilege to invite our party president, Honorable Pio Tikunduntua, to take us through this afternoon. I um, welcome each and every one of you to the memorial to honor the life of a man who touched so many lives with his deeds, words, and work. Honorable Justice Jerem Reddy was, is, and will never, ever be forgotten by the National Federation Party and those near and dear to him. Eight days ago, we were moved to tears during his final farewell in Auckland. This afternoon, we remember Mr. Reddy in the city and district that was his birthplace and his home. You will hear from persons who either worked with or knew Mr. Reddy very closely. Now, without taking any more time, I call upon our first guest, our former Prime Minister, and now the leader of the People's Alliance Party, Mr. Sitiveni Rambuka. Good afternoon. I have been here a few times, but I have not once formally apologized for what one of my corporals did in 1987. I was in Suva when I got a call from the committee that was in charge of looking after this compound and these magnificent premises to say that we had, on that day, some military tents erected in the compound. Very embarrassing for me, I didn't know who ordered the ten tents to go up. But we immediately removed them, and I called the commanding officer of the battalion in Lutoka at the time please come and explain, and he had to travel to Suba to explain why they had trespassed on this holy ground. So today, I apologize. I want us all now to close your eyes if you can, if you want to, and just listen. You can hear those cars on the road. We can hear the birds. We can hear ourselves coughing.
Today, I want us all to try and hear what the country is calling each and every one of us to do. Can you hear your country calling? Can you hear your name? I'm honored to be here Indeed, honored. Honored to be here for this memorial function for the late Honorable Justice Jairam Reddy. It follows his funeral in Auckland last week, which I attended and was honored to be asked to speak with the approval of Mr. Reddy's family. I was not invited to go. I just made it my duty to go. I knew I had to be there. I hear a certain echo of history here today. A few hours ago, the world stood still to study the life of Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. As the word world stood still, they also tried to hear the message that Her Majesty heard when she was suddenly called to become queen. I asked us this afternoon to also try and hear the call of our nation, the call of the people we love, the call of our home, on our lives, to do service. The call that the late Justice Jairam Reddy heard and devoted his life to. When Mr. Reddy, at my invitation, made his famous speech to the Great Council of Chiefs on June the 6th, 1997, he declared that he was the grandson of an indentured laborer. The grandson of a Girmitia. How deeply appropriate is it, it is then that we should be gathered here in his memory. This center stands as a monument of achievements the legacy of the settlers from India, the Girmatiers who crossed the black waters they call Kalapani to begin anew 
but initially very uncertain life journey in these islands. Through hard work, perseverance and persistence, these settlers adapted to Fiji as farmers and small business operators and adopted Fiji as home. Many became prominent in commerce and the professions. I believe that Mr. Reddy was one of the most illustrious descendants of the Girmitiers through his public service, his legal career, political contributions to Fiji, and his contribution to the world as an eminent member of the panel that sat in Rwanda to look at the atrocities of war that had been committed in that land. It was politics that brought Mr. Reddy and me together in search for true and complete and happy nationhood. He made his mark here too at the Girmit Center. When Mrs. Indira Gandhi, then Prime Minister of India, opened the first stage of the center on September 21st, 1981, Mr. Reddy was present. I understand he was one of the speakers on that important occasion. Another famous descendant of the Girmitiers the late Professor Bridgelaw, who was close to Mr. Reddy, was also a frequent visitor to the center. I hope you will not mind if I take this opportunity to honor him also today. I do this because it is impo important to keep Professor Bridgelaw's memory alive. The nation, the current and future generations must never be allowed to forget how he was treated by the cruel and heartless government that is currently in power in Fiji. It exiled him overseas because it did not like something he had said. He was spat upon and his spectacles were broken before he was deported. When he died in Australia, the government refused to allow his family to bring his ashes back to his birthplace near Lombasa. Shame on them. Shame on them for that. Shame on them. Remember Professor Lal for the Girmitiers and for all the people of Fiji. When I spoke at Mr. Reddy's funeral, I quoted from some of the memorable things he had said when he addressed the Great Council of Chiefs 25 years ago. This afternoon, I will share with you something else from that historic speech. As he came to the end of his remarks, he looked to Fiji's future and its journey on the road to modern nationhood. Mr. Reddy told the chiefs that much was asked of them. What do you hear being asked of you today? 
He then added, and I quote, much is asked of us all. He meant the entire population. He said, and I quote, let us therefore gather our courage and are set and set ourselves united to the finishing of the noble task to which our history, our heritage, and our motherland now calls us. And once again, I challenge you, do you hear that call? I'm here, Sitiveni, Rambuka, Kumeika a turn Democrat and promoter of peace, now ask, can you hear Fiji calling you? I can. I did. The call keeps me going. Make, wakes me up at night. I try to find out where I am, what needs to be done. It is a call of my nation and its people. You should hear it today at this gathering in memory of Mr. Reddy. It is now time for all of us and each of us to answer. We must come together in response to Fiji's call, which is now Fiji's cry. The country we love needs our love. For the sake of Mr. Reddy and all who heard the call and devoted their lives to serve this country, let us unite. Let us finish that noble task of making the motherland everything it can be. Please listen and hear that call. Get up, walk with us united. In memory of this great man, a man dies, legends do not die. Mr. Reddy is now a legend. Please honor him by serving Fiji with love. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Mbuka. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will now hear from Mr. Harris Chandra Sharma, former NFP leader and the Deputy Prime Minister in the NFP Labour Coalition Government. He is speaking from his home in Sydney, in Australia. Mr. Sharma. Jeram Reddy and I first met almost 63 years ago in November 1959 in Wellington, New Zealand. He was a law student at Wellington University and I was on my way to Hobart to enroll as a law student at the University of Tasmania. Since then, I was always hurried to him 
and Mr. Redley was Jay to me. On return home at the end of 1965, as a qualified lawyer, I joined Koya and Company as Mr. Koya's associate and started practice in the nanny branch of the company. By sheer coincidence, Jay was working for A.T. Patel and Company as Mr. Patel's associate. As a senior counsel, Jay was very helpful and always ready to give advice. It was the beginning of our friendship which matured and strengthened over a period of more than six decades. Shortly after my arrival in Nandi, Jay joined the Crown Law Office in Suva. During the first post-independent general elections held in 1972, Jay, on his own accord, campaigned in my constituency for three weeks. And I have no doubt that his presence got me quite a few votes. Both of us then traveled to Suva, anxiously awaiting the results of the contest between NFPs, Anirudh Kuber and Vivekanand Sharma. Contrary to the expectations of most people, and, and much to our delight, Kuwer won by over 700 votes. We celebrated the victory over a few glasses of beer. Later, I worked one or two days with Jay, who was then a senator, analyzing the pros and cons of the amendment to ELTA and concluded that though a small improvement on the existing legislation, nonetheless was in the interest of our farmers, particularly cane farmers, and so the passage through both houses of parliament. Mr. Reddy was a man of strong principles. Because he was appointed to the Senate as a nominee of the then leader of opposition, and the fact that both Mr. Koya and Jay had opposing views on the amendment to uh, ELTA, we decided that the party should uh, support the amendment. As I said, Mr. Reddy was a man of strong principles. Because he was appointed to the Senate as a nominee of the then leader of opposition, and the fact that both Mr. Koya and Jay had opposing views on the amendment to ALTA, he resigned on principle from the Senate in 1976. Following the September 1977 elections, Mr. Reddy was appointed the leader of opposition. I suspect that Jay, together with other parliamentarians, without my knowledge, had already decided that I be elected the Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives. Consequently, I served in that position from 1977 to 1982. With great tact, determination and perseverance, Jay reunited the party after it split into two factions in 1977. The NFP came close to winning the 1982 elections. We captured 24 seats, an increase of nine seats from the 1977 elections. 1982 to 1987 were the most productive, at the same time challenging period for the opposition. Several motions were moved and approved by the government in amended form and committee appointed to examine the pros and the cons of the motion and report, and report back to the parliament. Hence, quite a few scandals that could have caused huge losses to taxpayers' funds were exposed and prevented, mainly due to Mr. Reddy's efforts. The opposition ship was sailing smoothly until there was a serious altercation in December 1983 between Mr. Reddy and the then speaker, Tomasi Vakatora, resulting in Mr. Reddy leaving parliament and vowing never to return as long as Vakatora was the speaker. In May 1984, Mr. Reddy resigned from parliament and retired to his farm at Taitham Lokoka. 
Mr. Koya succeeded Mr. Reddy as NFP opposition leader. In 1986, I succeeded Mr. Koya as NFP and leader of opposition. However, several parliamentarians, including myself, strongly felt that Mr. Reddy be persuaded to return to the fold. One fine morning in late 1986, I met Jay on his Lotoka farm and was warmly welcomed. I kept my cool and finally succeeded in persuading him to give our party full and open support. His return brought a breath of fresh air to many members and well wishes. He greatly influenced the formation of the coalition with the Fiji Labour Party. The NFP FLP won the 1987 elections and formed the government under the Prime Ministership of late Dr. Timothy Babandra. Mr. Reddy was appointed the Attorney General of the new government and dignified that position until the government was toppled by the military coup on the 14th of May 1987. Jay was a natural leader and statesman and showed exceptional courage and leadership during the period when we were incarcerated as political prisoners during the first coup. It was Jay more than anyone else who gave us the courage, strength and hope during those hard times. He conducted the prayer songs at the prayer meetings. Two days later on Saturday evening, a soldier came and wanted to take Krishna Dutt and myself out of the group. I naturally went and told Jay what the soldier wanted to do. His instant and firm reply was that we were all going together or no one was going. The soldier was in, invited inside and Jay said, I am prepared to go in place of Harish Sharma. You have always been after me, and this is a good opportunity to take me where you want. He then told the soldier to inform his superiors that we were all going together or no one was going. As a, as a result, the authorities gave in and none of us was taken out of the group. There are many instances of his bravery, but time does not permit me to discuss them. No leader has suffered so much insult and humiliation as Mr. Reddy for his country and his people. But he cast aside personal head and, and worked together with Mr. Rambuka to give Fiji an internationally acclaimed 1997 constitution. I was out of Parliament from 1992 to part of 1994. Jay did not appoint a deputy during this period. When late Professor Bridgelal, another close friend of Jay and myself, asked Mr. Reddy why he had not appointed a deputy leader of opposition, Jay said that he could not find anyone he could fully trust. Within a few days of my election to Parliament in 1994, Jay appointed me as his deputy. Such was the trust and faith Jay had in me, and I am grateful for it. We will ever be grateful for the sacrifices you made for us, Jay. It was a privilege and honor for me to have enjoyed your friendship, your confidence for so many years. I say goodbye with a bleeding heart. Rest in peace, my friend. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sharma. Ladies and gentlemen, um, 
Now I uh, call upon Mr. Richard Naidu. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, last week, I described the opportunity to speak at Justice Reddy's funeral as one of the honors of my life. I call him uh, Mr. Reddy because that is what I always called him. But there are few men for whom I have more respect. He is a man I honor for his intellect, his integrity, his perseverance, his perseverance, and his humanity. So I might begin by saying that um, my first encounters with Mr. Reddy were not very promising. It was 1982, and Mr. Reddy, some of us will remember, was already a seasoned, far-sighted politician. I, on the other hand, was a 19-year-old Fiji Times reporter. And most of us know, most of us remember, Mr. Reddy did not enjoy journalists' attention. He did not like journalists at all. And I think he thought of us as uh, cheap headline chasers. And maybe he was right. But Professor Bridge Lau, he wrote of Mr. Reddy that he always spoke his truth as he saw it. And how could we, the young journalists in the press, we were rash, we were deadline driven, and we were not as smart as we thought we were, how could we understand the perspective from which Mr. Reddy spoke? Mr. Reddy was deeply intelligent. He understood history. He understood that public service was a burden to be carried, not a path to power and money. And we did not really understand these things as Mr. Reddy did. So Mr. Reddy may not in those days, he may not, thought of, he may not have thought much of me, but that could not dim the deep respect that I kept for him. You know, Mr. Reddy, he just radiated intellectual power. You just had to be around him and you could feel it. When I was a reporter and I was reporting in Parliament, even when it was not my time on, on the roster, and even when I was not on duty, I used to rush down to Parliament when I knew he was going to speak. You know, Mr. Reddy could command the whole house with his oratory, with his speeches. He didn't read them. He would have one single page of notes that he'd written down, and he would speak from there. And his opponents in the government, they knew not to interject. Mr. Reddy was almost always listened to in silence because they knew that if they interjected, Mr. Reddy would beat them down with a better reply. So in 1987, of course, that all changed my relationship with Mr. Reddy when I went to work with him and Dr. Mavandra. And I don't really have time here to talk about my many enjoyable account encounters with him. But they were deeply enriching, they were very thought-provoking, and often they were funny. Mr. Reddy had a sharp sense of humor. He often told jokes at his own expense. And this shows a man who's secure in himself. He's confident of his strengths. He's realistic about his weaknesses. And these are essential qualities in a good leader. You know, Mr. Reddy did not cling to power. You just heard from Mr. Sharma how he just walked away in 1983. Indeed, many of us know he was a reluctant politician. He did not really want political power at all. He saw politics as service. He wanted to build a new generation of leaders, not just for NFP, but for all of us. 
All of us here know Mr. Reddy's achievements. Some of us know him as a talented, clever, and generous lawyer. We know of him as a successful and dedicated politician and party leader. We know that he led his party and his community through some of Fiji's darkest times in, after 1987. We know of his famous work with Mr. Rambuka to bring Fiji back to democratic constitutional rule with the 1997 constitution. This was a constitution that the people wanted and for which the people's representatives in parliament voted. And then Mr. Reddy's final career as a judge first as the President of the Fiji Court of Appeal, and then as a judge in Rwanda. And I know that Mr. Reddy himself, he did not always see his achievements the way we see them. Indeed, I know that in some ways he thought of his 30 years in public life, he thought of it as a failure. But how could he be objective in that? How could he put his own life in perspective? You know, we think of NFP's other great leader, Mr. A.D. Patel. And I know comparisons are hard to do, and often they do not serve very much purpose. After all, Mr. Reddy and Mr. A.D. Patel, they were leaders of different times. They faced different challenges. But let me just say one thing, this one thing about them, nonetheless. Mr. A.D. Patel's achievements came at a time of optimism about Fiji's future. It was the 1960s. Independence was coming. People were working together. They were hopeful about independence. They were hopeful about self-government, looking forward to the future. Mr. Reddy's great achievements came in darker, more distressed times. Many people had deserted him. They were afraid even to be seen with him. Fiji's future was deeply uncertain. And a man of Mr. Reddy's talents could easily have said, my time is up, it is for others to do the work, I will walk away. But Mr. Reddy carried on. He kept his vision for Fiji's future. He took a road of dialogue and engagement. Not confrontation, not revenge. Even while many people criticized him for going that way. And this seems to me is a mark of his greatness. And I sometimes stop and think about this. This could not have been easy for him. From where did he get the courage and the commitment to pursue this reconciliation and a better future for all of us? And if it had not been for him, where would Fiji be now? What might Fiji's future have been? John F. Kennedy once said, victory has a thousand fathers, but defeat is an orphan. And for all the moments of greatness for which we remember Mr. Reddy, let's not forget there must have been many more moments of disappointment and despair. And if there is one lesson I want us to take from Mr. Reddy's life, if there is one lesson, let it be this. Let us learn to value and support our political leaders. Sometimes we are very quick to criticize them. We forget that these are the people who make sacrifices for us. These are the people who have given up their careers and their family and their private time to work in service for us. And these leaders go through times of difficulty and frustration and despair, just as Mr. Reddy did. Your leaders need your support. We need to remember the sacrifices they have made and the work they do and what they have to endure even now as opposition leaders under this government. Because in a real democracy, with a real democratic government, Opposition parliamentarians are treated with respect. Their criticism is listened to and it is understood. They are consulted on our laws. They work with the government to improve them. In times of crisis, such as we've had with COVID-19, they are brought in to work 
with and contribute their ideas to the government. They are not detained. They are not subjected to petty humiliations. They are not threatened with arrest and FICAC investigations. And let's not forget that it was because of the generous spirit offered by Mr. Rambuka in 1997 and accepted by Mr. Reddy. It's 25 years ago now, 1997, that Mr. Reddy came to work with Mr. Rambuka to design the 1997 Constitution. And there's many of us who do not remember that Constitution now. Even the main opposition party had to be invited to be part of government. That is the sort of government that that 1997 Constitution worked to achieve. So Mr. Reddy's vision, it went far beyond just bringing Fiji's two communities together. It was a vision for cooperative, democratic government. It was a vision that allowed people with different political views to work together to make Fiji better. And that is the vision that is lost now. That is the vision that is gone now. And that is the vision that our current government is not prepared to offer. But that is a vision to which the next government must return. So Mr. Reddy, he leaves many legacies to history. But those of us who study history, enjoy history, we know that history is um, as much about the future as the past. Mr. Reddy's achievements remind us of how good Fiji can be. They remind us that even in dark and difficult times, if we pool our talents, if we work together, we engage honestly with each other, we can achieve great things. We can master our futures. We can make everyone's lives better. And so finally, I want to say this. If we want to honor Mr. Reddy, and that is why we're here, if we want to honor Mr. Reddy, that's what we must do. We do not all have Mr. Reddy's gifts. We do not have his intellect, his understanding, his humanity. But all of us are capable of honesty, of goodwill, of commitment, and hard work. Mr. Reddy has shown us what can be done. And as Mr. Rambuka has already told us, it is for us to pursue his deep ambitions for our country. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Richard. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will now hear from my longtime friend and former parliamentary colleague of the late Mr. Jaron Reddy. And I would like to invite to the stage Mr. Vinod Patel. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, today we gather to pay tribute to late Justice Jay Ramredi, our distinguished son of Fiji, an outstanding leader, not only of our community, but also of Fiji. My focus today is on his political leadership, which lasted for over three decades, from 1977 to 1979. Regarding his professional career, it is sufficient to say that as a lawyer, he had a few equals, and as a judge, he earned international distinctions and fame, serving a judge on the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and from 2003 to 2008. You will recall the 1990 constitutions advocated a positive discrimination against our community. In particular, which contributed to the widespread fear, insecurity, and anxiety. It's contributed to a massive number of our people migrating to other countries. The situation deeply pained Jairam to see the 
help, help, helplessness of the people, he spoke to me often on this subject and said that those who can, they will go to settle overseas, but the majority of our people cannot, and we need to find ways to secure this future. In this regard, he said, it was time for the leaders to bury their differences, unite the community, and work towards reconciliations through peaceful means to make Fiji a better place for everyone. To achieve this, we need to seek replacement of the 1990 constitution with a constitution that guaranteed basic citizen rights to our people, including justice, equality, and dignity. At this time, there was a lot of anger and fury against Prime Minister Mbuka and his interim government for humiliation, violence, and injustice committed against our people. However, there was also a strong current of opinion that begging for reconciliation, dialogue, discussion from people who violated us, mean for the humiliations of our community. Instead, they call our international assistance, non cooperation and assistance in create economic hardship and forcing the interim government to accept our demands. However, Mr. Reddy felt that it was not a time for revenge, but to reconcile and rescue Fiji through dialogue and discussion. He said that the cause of economic harm and hardship would also make life difficult for everyone, including the ordinary people of, across the Fiji. With this in mind, he strongly advised the NFP participate in the 1992 election so that we would create a leadership base to initiate dialogue for the replacement of the controversial 1990 constitution with a constitution that met the basic requirements of democratic constitution. Fortunately, the NFP won enough seats against the Fiji Labour Party, which enabled Jeram Reddy to become the leader of opposition. Once he became the leader of opposition and noting seriousness, seriousness of the future of our people and Fiji, he closed thriving law practice to serve full time as the leader of opposition. He devoted all his energy and time from 1992 to 1997 and worked like a magician unsuccessfully convincing Prime Minister Siti Ramoka that the only way forward to Fiji was the multiracial path and uniting the people of Fiji. The 1997 constitution was the greatest gift from Jairam Reddy to the people of Fiji. Without Jairam, Fiji could not have formulated and approved the best constitution out of all constitutions ever written, which gave equality, justice, and dignity to all the people of Fiji. It restored Fiji's honor and respect internationally and democratic nation with the promise to uphold democratic values of principles in the government of beautiful nation of ours. Despite such achievement, in the 99 election, our community rejected him and NFP, which would remain the most mysterious event in Fiji's political history. This rejection taught Jairam Reddy's heart, which some critics call it the most painful betrayal in the history of the Fiji Indian community. Sadly, Jairam never recovered from this rejection by his own people for whose welfare and sacrifice his life, which hurt him for the rest of his life. It contributed to the mental and physical decline, and I say this was a deep pain and sorrow that he never recovered from it. It was because of this rejection that Mr. Jaira Amredi opted not to, return, not to return to Fiji, in, and after completing his term, 
As an international judge in Tanzania, 2008, he settled in New Zealand. Jairam Reddy left a legacy of the leadership and glowed with vision, courage, compassion, honesty, integrity, and sacrifice. Looking all at the current trend of politics in Fiji and worldwide, I am sorry to say that there is not going to another leader like Jairam Reddy Evan. However, his legacy will live and hopefully inspire future politicians to follow his footprint. footprint. God bless you all. Thank you, uh, Mr. Patel. Ladies and gentlemen, I now call upon Mr. Shiva Rajan Reddy, a nephew of Mr. Reddy, to speak on behalf of Mr. Reddy's family. Thank you. O Vaka Vina Vinaka O Viti, Na Vanva O Tudake Na Tukina. O Vaka Sagara Na Nomu, Vei Vaki Lo Gantaki, Enaitavi Teki Vukata. The Soti O New Daka Dolin Vei Ikani O Sonongu Bulatiko, E Kevuku E Senga E Iko O Na Senga Nirawani. I thank Fiji on the land which I stand. I seek your blessing in the task on which I embark. Forgive me when I wrong you, for you are my existence, and without you, I cannot be. When LBA 3 left the port of Madras on 21st May 1903, it probably did not know how the three generations of the Reddy family would greet their fates and destinies, nor would two of its passengers know on the journey that they were fated, that is, to be together. Bayana Reddy, the lone adventurer, and Achamma Reddy, along with her parents and siblings, left India with the hope of improving their lives and the lives of their future generations. The events that followed were not always easy and not always fruitful but they had to endure and keep their spirit alive because one in the future was going to fight to honor their journey by attempting to unite the many peoples of this great country. Dada Jai, forged in the fires of history, would someday become an integral part of it. Jai Dada was born on the 12th of May, 1937, to Pethi Reddy and Yangta Reddy. My grandparents from an early age were hard workers and achieved much in life. From being one of the first in the West to upgrade to mechanized farming and owning a dairy farm in Lololo. From being threatened with death by people of their own community to having their land leases expire over two times. They watched their sons and daughters advance in life in front of their very eyes a very proud moment for any descendant of an indentured laborer, especially when one ascends in the national eyes. The following stories and memories are a testament to how Jay Dada came to be the man he was. His more prolific achievements are well known and will be covered by the speakers. Therefore, I resign myself to exploring the events that may have led Dada to be who he was. Of childhood and youth, during the 1930s and even in the 1950s, education was a commodity that could be considered a luxury for descendants of the indentured laborers. Dada was encouraged to pursue education by his extended family, and at the age of six, he left his parents to live, in, live and study in Rakureki. He would attend school and only be home on some weekends and in school holidays. I am told he experienced great homesickness and during those days and one day decided to skip school. He got on a bus from Reki Reki to Lotoka, planning to get off in Drasa. Coincidentally, 
the same bus was boarded by his sister, Pushpa auntie, and brother, Dada Sharda. Auntie would not believe that it was her brother sitting at the back of the bus, but all three were happy to be united as they got off in Drasa. He chose Drasa as his grandmother was there and she would protect him from the anger of his relatives for what he had done. He knew what strategy to use. Dada enjoyed spending time with his siblings. There were very few cars during those days and horses were used as a mode of transport for short to medium distances. Dada loved horses as a child. He loved the independence and the free-spirited nature of being able to go places on them. On one such occasion, he, perhaps rashly, chose to go riding in the rain around the interior of Vakambuli. It was not the usual rain, and the rivers were quickly inundated. Thinking that he could make it across, he urged his horse to do so, getting trapped in the raging floodwaters soon after. Upon hearing his cry for help, a group of Fijian villagers, risking their own lives, rescued him from certain death. A foreboding of his dormant risk-taking personality and his deep love and respect for the Fijian people. After primary education, Dada attended what is now known as Sri Vivekananda College as a boarding student. According to the book In the Eye of the Storm, written by late Professor Brijlal, it is mentioned that he was far from the ideal student and that one would imagine him to be. While excelling in history and English, he would find that maths eluded him. His teachers used to be puzzled at him because of his antiques, which included sneaking out of hostel to watch movies, playing pranks on other students, and being a free spirit. At one point, he was expelled from his hostel and attended school as a day scholar while living with his future friend and educationalist, Dr. Sokad Ali Sahib. Indeed, it came to a point where he was unable to sit for his senior examination as his teachers felt he was not ready. However, he was not ready to accept this and left as we see and went to DAV Suva in 1954 to, in order to pursue senior Cambridge. He did not make it on his first and only attempt. However, life had different ideas for him as he was sent to New Zealand in 1955 when his younger brother, my father, was just three years old to pursue law. Back then, it was not easy to go study abroad and it was expensive as well. His parents, however, made a lot of sacrifices and they managed to give him that opportunity. He was enrolled in Wellington Technical College where he finished his university entrance. He was assisted by his close friend, Dr. Sarkat Ali Saheb, and his younger brother, Hussein Saheb. Later, he completed his law degree from the University of New Zealand in 1960. The opportunity provided to him can be attributed to luck and his companionship. However, there was a point in his life where the somewhat rebellious and carefree capable child became the starting point of the man we later came to know, admire and hold in reverence. He started respecting opportunities and the need to make the most of them, even if it meant that you had to change yourself and let go of the past. The private life of a public figure. Dada J went on to become a lawyer, admitted to the Supreme Court in New Zealand in 1960, and to the High Court of Fiji in 1961. He started his professional career in law, starting with being a law clerk at Bell Gully & Co. from 1958 to 1960. He was a staff solicitor and associate with Mr. A.D. Patel & Co. from 1961 to 1968. He was the Crown Counsel at the Crown Law Office Suva from 1966 to 1968. He was the principal legal officer of the Crown Office Law Office in Lotoka from 1968 to 1970. He was the partner of his own firm with Sturt Reddy & Co. in Lotoka from 1971 to 1988. And he was the sole practitioner in Lotoka from 1988 to 1997. 
He was also the president of the Fiji Court of Appeal from, from March to August in 2000 and January 2002 till April of 2003, and was the permanent judge for the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda from 2003 till 2008. Being a lawyer in that time was akin to being a celebrity. The consensus being that lawyers were looked up to as well as respected individuals and as status and connections in society. I would like to believe that my dada was one such person, but who despite his naughty childhood inspired a lot of future lawyers and judges. One of my grand uncle, Sesha Reddy, who was also considered a pioneer in his life, perhaps for his desire to stand up to oppression and challenge all known unknowns, encouraged Jajada to emulate the late A.D. Patel, and perhaps this was from where the public figure was born, as not only was he an original founder of NFP, but a renowned Noya and leader as well. Dada J will appear as an enigma to all who knew him as an acquaintance in his public life. He had few friends and fewer still were close confidants. His interests and hobbies and nuances are best known by very few people who were granted access to the private life of Dada. And so I take today as my moment to shed some light on the private life of the public figure we knew. Dada loved watching old Hindi movies in theaters and loved listening to ghazals and old romantic songs. Of that, he grew up watching what few movies came to Fiji during that time, which features actors such as Dilip Kumar, Raj Kapoor, and Dev Anand, as well as Wahida Rahman, Meena Kumari, and Nargis. Dilip Kumar and Nargis were his favorites. Movies gave rise to his love for music, and he enjoyed the works of Talat Mahmood and would often sing at family occasions. However, he rarely sang in his later years once he embarked on his political life. During his 80th birthday and before illness enveloped him, I did get an opportunity to hear him sing. He was listening to my dad and his colleagues sing after a few drinks, and he told them that they did not appreciate the songs they sang. He sang an old song from start to finish and with all the emotions that came with it. Suffice to say, never had it, having heard the man sing, I was shocked and awed. While he was an avid lover of romantic songs and movies, he was not the typical softy that one would associate with such predispositions. He was a hard man, not one to suffer fools and lazy ones too. Once he got going, there was very little to do to deter him. He held honor and sense of propriety in high regard and would seldom forget what he had forgiven. However, he was not one to hold grudges and had a short fuse and was approachable even though his outer aura suggested otherwise. He cherished loyalty and trust above all other traits and would stick to his guns until he either won or was no longer needed for battle. He was a highly persuasive and encouraging person also. He, on one occasion, managed to convince his younger brother, Janard and Reddy, to pursue education and give up his own rebellious nature. This led to Janard and Reddy studying in New Zealand and going on to having a very successful career in economics. Jayadada was also a foodie. He enjoyed the attention of his auntie Subamma, or Eknambar Awa, as we called her. She would prepare all manner of delights for him and us whenever we used to gather in the Viango. He enjoyed a variety of foods, but vegetarian dishes made by his aunt were his favorites and would often forgo meat over them. He enjoyed various pursuits such as reading and the old horse racing bets. He also enjoyed the works of William Shakespeare and could recite many famous lines during his various public and private engagements. Apart from his political life, which I will not go on to here, and I'm sure it will be amply covered by others, he also delved into public life, offering pro bono legal services to people who deserved it and being on various institutions, such as the Sangam, where he performed various functions and been, can be considered a very lovable figure in that regard. In his private life, he was very well regarded and loved by his immediate and extended family members, 
and was an immense source of pride and inspiration to many of us. After he left the political stage, and over the years as many forgot him, you would sometimes be reminded, especially when my dad would be mistaken for him, and we would mistakenly be greeted and respected, and then must inform them that it was not him, but his youngest brother. The person then would recount their story or tell us how great he was. Such was the respect and admiration he commanded. Forgiven, but not forgotten. Perhaps in hindsight, and for me personally, I do not consider the 1997 Constitution to be his greatest achievement, or even walking with a coup maker to be his greatest misunderstood moment. For me, his greatest moments were when he chose to forgive. In 1987, amongst the calamity and uncertainty all the people of this country were going through, we all suffered, but some more than others. I was born on 4th of August, 1987, and was only a few weeks old when the second coup happened. During the search of Jaydada, some soldiers acted, perhaps on orders, on, on orders they maybe did not wish to obey, and barged into my father's home and took him away for interrogation. I am told he was kept from us for two days. I could have nearly lost a father who perhaps I would have had no memories of at all. I tell this story not to reawaken a sense of anger or entitlement to retribution. Of course, many others suffered, perhaps maybe more than my potential perceived suffering. I say this to put into context that although Dada forgave the perpetrators of the coup of 1987, he did not forget what his own people, his family, his community, and the rest of the country went through. Such would have been his desire to avoid such a repetition in the future that he chose the only solution that was available to him, walk and reason with the very people who felt threatened enough to turn Fiji upside down. And this is not an exaggeration. Fijians at that time felt threatened, whether rightfully or wrongfully so. And it is this feeling that needed to be addressed and protections made so that any action on such feelings did not harm the nation. He did so and succeeded. However, he was deemed in some circles as a traitor. To those circles, Dada has forgiven you too. But he could not forget your short-sightedness. At that moment after his defeat, a personal tragedy also struck. His beloved auntie and our Aknambar Awa passed away. He chose to draw the curtains on his political career and chose to go back to serving people through law. He had an incredible journey, and he would tell you that. Pain, love, and some things that are not forgotten. After his retirement from the Rwanda Tribunal, he gave up all public pursuits and did give advice when he was asked. His experiences, he experienced great longings to return to Fiji and save his people again. However, he knew that it was the time for new leaders and new ideas to take center stage and he was no longer the same person. Much went on in his life after 2008. He lost his eldest son, Sanjay, and this devastated him greatly. He sometimes blamed himself for putting the public ahead of his family, although no one ever complained, as they understood the need and his desires that were greater than anyone, and of course, the immense love they had for their husband, the father, and the grandfather. He made great memories with his family during this time and on many occasions visited Fiji and spent time with his brothers, his friends, and sometimes engaged in public activities, especially Sangam conventions, where he would occasionally be invited to be a chief guest. Such was his love. Some years ago, illness started taking him, and it was a very surreal experience for those who were close to him. The pain of witnessing a great and talented mind lose it all is a pain no one ever is made ready for. And I take this opportunity to thank all the people who looked after him during this time. You're warriors in your own right. He was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, a brain disorder that slowly destroys the memory retention and thinking abilities of a person. This day is currently no cure for this disorder. 
During the last year, I came to realize something about the man, and it's something that Fiji must hear today. Your son never stopped loving you and your people. On one occasion, Dada Jay requested Auntie Chandra that he wanted to speak to my father. Out of remembrance and curiosity, I asked my dad if I could speak to him, knowing that he would not be able to recall who I was, even if I told him. When he spoke to me, he spoke clearly and assumed for some reason that I was a client who was seeking to perform a land transaction of some sort. He told me to go to the land's office before 4 p.m. as they will close by then and told me to find a good JP to certify my documents and to be very efficient about it as delays would cause me further delays with said transaction. At that time, I foolishly wrote it off as a kind gesture until last Wednesday, I met a man outside Ministry of Forestry in Lotoka and he greeted me and paid respects and condolences to a man for who had not been in the public eye for the better part of 20 years. At that moment, along with remembering our phone conversation, I realized he was one of the originals and there was no longer people like him. He loved and he was loved by people who understood him and what he stood for. What I would say if I could. Bula Fiji, I am no longer with you and if I could be with you, I would say these words to you. God bless Fiji, God bless her and her people to a better future. Through adversity and challenges, you must aim for the stars. There are problems and there are always solutions. Find and pursue them. Pay good attention to yourselves and take care of yourselves. Your fate is in your hands. Give priority to education and give in to better future. Always remember who you are and where you have come from and walk towards where you need to go. Only with unconditional unity can we progress as a nation. Only through consensus and mutual respect can we thrive. You all have a great burden in this mortal world and I give you my blessings. With much love, Jerem Reddy. I thank the organizers for this event, the attendees, and the families and friends of the late Jerem Reddy for sharing with me the experiences through verbal and written work. Thank you for honoring the grandson of an indentured laborer and a son of Fiji. God bless. Thank you, Mr. Shivoredi. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Justice uh, Jeram Reddy uh, served with distinction in the TISI Sangam. Um, <clears throat> his close friend and uh, former Secretary General of the TISI Sangam, Mr. Demen Gonda, uh, we now invite him to pay tribute to Mr. Reddy. Thank you. Nisambula and Namaskaram. As a friend and fellow life member of TISI Sangam, Fiji, I have this message for you on the life and service to TISI Sangam by late Honorable Justice J. Ram Reddy. And I wish to advise that this cannot be construed to be political in nature, as this is for a man I admired and the love we all have for him. I would like to uh, thank and acknowledge Mrs. Uh, Chandra Reddy and all members of the Reddy family for supporting a simple, kind and very noble Mr. Reddy for his work and service in Sangam. I attended the funeral service of the great Mr. Reddy, an iconic member, soul and beacon of morality of the TISI Sangam and the many friends around him. After the service, I commented to one of my colleagues that I, fell, I feel as if I have just completed a course on leadership. The life of Honorable Reddy was all about a platform of unity by leadership through the pathway of honesty. Mr. Jeram Reddy was a life member of TISI Sangam and served the organization as our legal advisor from 1977 until when he was elected as leader of opposition for the National Federation Party. He resigned from this position after being elected as a leader of uh, the National Federation Party or leader of the opposition with a simple note saying 
that as a holder of, of public office, it is not ethical for him to serve as a legal advisor for TISI Sangha. However, Justice Reddy continued to grace many of our village, district, or national events. The former Secretary General of TISI Sangam Fiji, Mr. Ranga Gounder, who now resides in Auckland, sent me the following message as part of his contribution for this memorial service, and I quote, Justice Jeram Reddy and the TISI Sangam were intertwined and inseparable for over five decades. In the early 70s, a large group of members requested for major changes to the organization. Almost 50 years has passed since the formation of the organization, and members wanted changes to set stage for the next 50. In 1976, Justice Jairam Reddy was invited to be the guest speaker at the annual general meeting of TISI Sangam held in Luvulotoka. A large crowd of members assembled in anticipation for the rebirth of Sangam and a new way forward. It is said that cometh the hour and cometh the man, and Justice Reddy spoke eloquently and questioned each and every member of what they had done to Sangam, that our forefathers took so much time, sacrifice and hard work to establish. He did not mince his words. And the crowd patiently heard every word he uttered. He challenged members to leave the past and focus on the future. On the completion of his speech, the pin drop silenced room erupted into claps and cheers. TISI Sangam emerged as a stronger and united organization. End of quote. I had known of Justice Jairam Reddy during our high school and early 20s in my life. I had the good fortune of being known by him and developed a friendship with him in 1999. I found him to be very simple, despite the intelligence and the worldly status he held. In all his speeches to our Sangam events, he took time to appreciate the many workers, volunteers and members for their hard work, dedication and loyalty. His description of the founders of TISI Sangam as ordinary men and women with little or no formal education were more intelligent, visionaries and in fact better educated than the educated, in my opinion, were great words for founders like Sadhukup Swami, Danvir, M. N. Naidu, T. A. J. Pillai. This was attributed to all those great men and women who had set up and built educational centers for the future generation like me and you. He also had great respect for women. And again, I quote from his speech delivered at the 2013 TISI convention in Lotoka. And I quote, <clears throat> Disrespect and violence against women is a social evil. I am sorry to say that despite significant social changes, violence against women is far too prevalent. And a quote, he urged both men and women to have a role in educating the people that violence and disrespect to women is not okay. Justice J. Ramrady also frequented the valivers of TISI Sangam or the youth group of TISI Sangam and always had positive and mentoring message for them. The youth of Sangam had tremendous respect for Justice J. Ram Reddy and enjoyed his company at formal and social functions. An appropriate message to the youth was at the 18th April 2003 convention. And he said, and I quote, know the place you were born in, know the people, know the organization like Sangam and understand what the motives and what motivates them. When you are honestly involved in this search, you will know how the world is made and how it is destroyed. You have to choose to be on the side of those who make the world and not who cause destruction to it and then learn how to protect the world." End of quote. Justice J. Ram Reddy was always about unity. 
selflessness and inclusiveness. His speeches to TISI conventions continue to be this consistent message and asked everybody and everyone to be part of the multiracial and multicultural country. TISI Sangam made a change to his objectives and mission in April 1938. And the change was that Sangam was to serve all people in Fiji. A change that Justice J. Ram Reddy always spoke about and appreciated. The people who had made that change. Many of us in Sangam work with this simple objective. To serve the organization and to serve all the people in the nation. In a private session with Justice J. Ram Reddy, he once said to me that he was fortunate that he was born and he lived in times of people like Sadhu Kubswami, Mahatma Gandhi and Nelson Mandela. And I have this to say to the soul of Justice J. Ram Reddy. I am privileged and blessed that you, sir, grace this land of Fiji and the TISI Sangam for the many to learn and live life through the pathway of honesty, selflessness and loyalty. And I do not see in the horizon another tall, handsome gentleman with a file in his left hand climbing the stage for a speech at a Sangam event anytime soon. Justice Honorable J. Ram Reddy, life member 175 of the Den India Sarmarg Ikya Sangam. Thank you, Binaka. Thank you, uh, Mr. Demand Gondor. Ladies and gentlemen, and now we will hear from two parliamentary colleagues of Mr. Reddy in the 1990s. Firstly, from Mr. Dorsami Naidu, and then uh, following him will be Mr. Pramod Chan, who is currently a Vice President of NFP. Can I invite Mr. Naidu to the stage? Thank you. Thank you, uh, MC. Can I recognize the uh, people in Vanua of Latoka for allowing uh, us to have this meeting on, the, on their land. I think enough has been said on the memory of the great leader. We were in parliament from 1992 to 1999. And he was a great leader, a great visionary, as people have said. Now, Mr. Reddy is now with our ancestors. His spirit is there. Let me take a different view on his memory. Because of what has been so far said, he was a man for the time. In 1972, when he became a member of the Senate, like it's been said, he's never sought power. He sacrificed. He never sought wealth. Whenever he felt he did not have the confidence of his colleagues, he resigned, walked away from it. But. It was in his blood. Remember, Hamlok ke yaha laya gaya. Jameen kamane ke liye. We did not come to conquer. We worked the land. We became part of the land here. It's in our blood. That's what Mr. Reddy felt as well. And he always said, that we want to not only coexist, we want to be part of the nationality of this country. We, as he said to the great council of chiefs, we did not come to conquer, we did not come to take, but we came, we were brought here to be part of this land. And uh, unfortunately, the Girimit years have been very badly misunderstood over the times. 
And it's even more unfortunate that Mr. Reddy has been un, un, has not been understood by his own people. By you take 1977 or 1976, Alta was the best thing that happened. People must realize that there was a deed of session in this country. And there was another community. You had to work with the community. But at the same time, the other community must also understand that we did not come only to make money and walk away. They must have been part of the business community, whether Chinese, Indian, or European. But the Girmitiers were brought here and made a part of this country. And uh, when the coup happened, you're going to realize when the coup happened, I, I give uh, respect to Mr. Rambuka because five years later we had elections, unlike the abrogation of the Constitution in 2009 and 2006, elections seven years later. And we had consensus after 1994, whereby when I was instrumental in uh, ensuring the defeat of the Rambuka budget, and Mr. Rambuka, you want to give him credit, and that's why Mr. Jairam Reddy used to confide in us. Look, this man could have done another coup. He didn't. He fought an election. And he came and worked with us, believed that we can bring this country back. And that's when the 1997 Constitution came into being. He worked, Mr. Reddy worked tirelessly, not only with Mr. Rambuka, but with his own opposition. He tried to bring the other opposition, Fiji Labour Party, into the fold and work together as Mr. Rambuka had problem with his own nationalists. But they both succeeded. We came up with a good constitution, better than 1970, better than 1990. Unfortunately, we, probably the other parliamentarians in NFP, let him down. Because his vision was for inclusiveness, for unity, for nationality, for all the communities to work together. We didn't sell that idea to our people. And unfortunately, our community is as fickle then as it is today. Remember the $2 cane payment. You know, the uh, government was going to pay $2, but you'd have had something deducted from that. All Mr. Reddy said was, pay it on time. Don't have to pay it earlier. It's only $2. But the community, the cane farmers went against him. Now, at this juncture, when we are on a journey to work together, to come together, are we again going to be sold for $180? For a few dollars more, you have around you collapsing economy. You have around you a medical system that's gone, education system that's gone, civil service that's in disarray. And yet you people, people don't see it. I, I'm amazed. You had Mr. Reddy sacrifice everything, did not benefit from any union funds like another leader. He, did, he realized that when the 87 constitution went to lay the foundation for the 1997 constitution, you had to work. It's not like what somebody said, are you going to eat the constitution? Knowing full well what happened in 87. So look what happened in 2009, 2006. It's very unfortunate that we, the fellow NFP members, may not have done enough 
to put Mr. Reddy's vision to the people that what is the purpose of the Constitution? What is it there for? Now, I think it, it is time we, you know, people must understand politics. We as candidates are not going to take it very far unless you, the people, explain to your people there is more to life than $180. There is more to life <coughs> when huge migration is now happening again. Bigger than in 87, probably, when our workers are all going. And what do we have? Four dollars is the minimum wage. You can't even buy toothpaste for that. But I will not go on any further. All I want to remember is this man whom we have greatly wronged. He went into self-exile because of us. Because he felt he could not come back here once the 1997 constitution went. And like People say he was a great dialogue, he, he negotiation, dialogue. He brought Sangam together. He brought the country together, the different factions of NFP. And he never believed in racial politics. Unfortunately, in 1992, he was painted otherwise. He was maligned. But one thing about him, he never liked to defend. Didn't come out and fight. He thought, that his community, the people understood. And probably we did a great disservice. Now is the time, I think. We can put it right, work together. You need, this is the time when we must, to have power, to have some control, to have say in the government of this country, how the municipal councils work, how this country works, we have to work with another group. The government doesn't want to work with us. We have to work with Mr. Rambuka. He's always offered his hand in friendship. Why don't we accept it? We don't have to kiss him, but accept his hand in friendship. And that would be the greatest memorial to a great leader. Thank you. Uh, President of the National Federation Party, Mr. P. of Tikonduandua, the party leader, Honorable Professor Abhiman Prasad, ladies and gentlemen. I bring sympathies and condolences from the Northern Division, the NFP family, to the Reddy family. I, I am privileged to stand here in this memorial service to just share a few things. Many things have been said about the late Justice Jaram Reddy. A very great man, a wonderful person. I had the privilege of spending a lot of time with him in Lambasa when he used to come and campaign when we fought the 1994 general election. But one thing I want to say, that life is a journey. Jeevan ek safar hai. In this life, we will go through storms, challenges, and many things will come our way. But you know, God has created all of us, and we have that strength in us to endure. And the late Justice Jaram Reddy was one man who was able to endure all those storms of life that came to him. A man of loyalty, a man of trust, when we got elected 20 members of parliament in uh, 1994, in the first caucus, he told us, I would rather have lesser members, but loyal and trustful members of parliament that we can work together. So I must simply say this. He was a man of courage, never feared anything, but he had a very strong mind. He was able to calculate things, and he was able to speak, as we have already been told. So I must say this, in life, we have a journey, all of us. When we are born, and then 
we are looked after, parents looked after. We come to an age where we do some naughty things, where we do some right things or wrong things. However, we continue that journey. And it is not something that how you begin your journey. It's important how you finish. And today I must say with the greatest of respect to a great son of Fiji that he has really left a great legacy for the people of Fiji. I know we have some more speakers and our leader hasn't spoken, so I'll just try and finish up in a few more sentences. People of Fiji, we have already heard from Mr. Rambuka. Hear what the country is saying. The country is crying. Come to my aid. Help me. Otherwise, these two dictators will destroy the beloved nation of Fiji. Remember this, dictators have been removed from various nations and it is time for the people of Fiji to come to the ballot boxes and tick them out. We need leaders that are courageous. We need leaders that walk for the people, not give handouts to buy votes. Sit in your office for three years, and when the fourth year the election comes, you go on distributing things, making roads, doing this and that. People of Fiji, you are wise. You are very wise, and you are, you know, you know what to do. There's something that I want to read to you. It comes from the scriptures. The wisest men said this. He said, there is gold and a multitude of rubies, but... The lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. And this is the wise man that we had the privilege to walk with him. And I am very, very grateful to God Almighty that I had the privilege of walking with him. And I always admired him, always told him, Mr. Reddy, I look to you as my father. A great man. And you know what? Wisdom comes from God. Wisdom doesn't come from stupid people, silly people. We have two stupid people governing Fiji. We need to kick them out. God bless you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Promotion, and also Mr. Dursa Menaidu. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Radio Wells, when he was alive, strongly believed in the, in the empowerment of women in politics. And now we will hear the perspectives of, uh, firstly, Mrs. Uh, Priscilla Singh, followed by Mrs. Anita Narayan, uh, ladies who closely worked with uh, both Mr. and Mrs. Reddy in the 1990s. Our leader, Professor Biman Prasad, President of the party, Mr. Tikondo Andua, ladies and gentlemen. I am deeply humbled and honored to be given the opportunity to be a part of the celebration for the life of one of the greatest sons of Fiji. When I became actively involved with the National Federation Party in 1992, my guide and mentor was Mrs. Chandra Reddy, wife of the late Honorable Justice J. Ram Reddy. She encouraged me to participate at every forum available to NFP. I took inspiration from both Mr. and Mrs. Reddy's work and joined the NFP team in working for women's empowerment in all political processes. My journey officially began at the parliamentary complex in Viuto. I was assigned a small office and tasked with organizing the NFP women's movement. Of course, this was at no cost to the taxpayers, as I was a volunteer. But what started as a small project turned into a mass movement of women that effectively championed the rights of our women and girls. Our voices were heard and recognized both in and outside parliament. My work was personally monitored by Mr. Reddy, and the voice and power of women in leadership was on full display in any elections of any kind for the first time in 1996 in the municipal elections. 
at a meeting three months prior to these elections to evaluate the progress of women and their applications to contest the municipal polls throughout all municipalities, Mr. Reddy instructed, and I use the word instructed, me to contest the Suva City Council elections. Naturally, this took me by surprise, and I was therefore naturally hesitant. But Mr. Reddy was not taking no for an answer. He believed three months was enough for preparations and said he placed a lot of faith in my ability to campaign and win. And so I did. I was assigned a difficult ward with three major squatter settlements and campaigned for the first time for myself as a candidate. 1996 saw a record number of women winning local government election under the NFP banner throughout all town and city councils. And we wait to get back local governance into this country. I won in Suva, Mrs. Anita Narayan in Ba, and later served as Deputy Mayor of Ba Town Council. Mrs. Milia Tong won in Lotoka and served as Mayor. Andi Makalesi Lutuziri won in Nandi and also went on to become Mayor of the Jet Set Town. This was the first time NFP had women elected at local government level. And I know we did our party leader and our party proud. It was Mr. Reddy's foresight, vision, and his genuine belief of empowering women that enabled women's participation in what then was very male-dominated public spaces. The success of NFP women at the election set the stage for women to participate at all decision-making levels within the party. We were represented at branch level, working committee, and the management board. Women were also represented in the selection committee in the lead up to the 1999 election. Every convention thereafter featured women, and we now had every opportunity to raise issues and participate fully. This was made possible only because Mr. Reddy, as leader, gave us the opportunity. The NFP women's movement's efforts were recognized by other civil society organizations, and we worked very closely with them. The NFP women were represented at all forums convened by the Fiji Women's Rights Movement, which works around legislative reform, and were part of workshops, consultations around the Family Law Bill, the Change in Citizenship Rights Bill, and all other important legislation. Mr. Reddy was well informed of our efforts by our team leader and chief campaigner, Mrs. Chandra Reddy. Those years, the 90s, saw a different level of interest by senior members of NGOs and civil society organizations, namely Ms. Shamima Ali, Ms. Imrana Jalal, the late Mrs. Mavis Basuwaya, Mrs. Esiteri Kamikamida, and Mrs. Sulueti Siwatimbao, to name a few. We worked amicably across parties with a common goal. As I reflect on yesteryears, I feel that the leadership of Mr. Reddy demonstrated trust, goodwill, forgiveness, and nation building. And this was felt in all quarters. We, the women in NFP, tried to emulate the same. Another important phase that needs mention are the challenges faced by us as a party and in campaigning for the 97 Constitution. We all knew the commitment with which Mr. Reddy worked towards achieving the best acclaimed Constitution that Fiji ever had. As we campaigned for the 1999 elections, we took the message of the 97 Constitution to the electorate and the role our leader played in its success. When competing parties attempted to trivialize the constitutional achievement, we suggested to Mr. Reddy that we change our stance from focusing on the Constitution. I received a curt response. Priscilla, there is no other way to do this. A good constitutional framework is the basis and necessity for everything else to follow. Mr. Reddy had a lighter side, and I was fortunate to be in social gatherings where Mr. Reddy would relax and enjoy a few drinks and wonderful guzzles. His favorite guzzle was the famous 
आज जाने की जिद ना करो बाय फरीदा खनो मोस्ट टाइम्स आई वॉज पुट इन अ स्पॉट एंड आस्ट टू सिंग अलॉन्ग अ लॉट हैज बीन सेड अबाउट मिस्टर रेडी ऑफ द लास्ट वीक एंड हियर टूडे वॉट आई हैव शेयर टूडे इज माई वर्क एंड पर्सनल जर्नी विद ऑनरेबल जस्टिस जयराम रेडी He is someone that I greatly respected and learned from. Mr. Reddy has left an invaluable and profound impact in my life, and I consider myself privileged to have known and worked with him. He was a truly remarkable person and a man of innate decency and goodwill. There will never be another Jairam Reddy. He will forever remain in our hearts and minds. Thank you. Don't worry my speech is short and sweet because I reckon Priscilla has covered all aspects of our women's wing. Uh Bula namaste namaskaram and a very good afternoon to you all. When the leader honorable Biman Prasad called me requesting either Adish or I to say a few words during today's memorial service in honor, honor of a great son of Fiji the late honorable justice jairam reddy i did not hesitate to accept the offer because recently um after the events of 2006 i took a very low profile in politics reasons i leave it to you to uh, work out um adish had to attend a two day low asia conference at the sovital resort so this is a con a contribution a combined contribution from me and adish um honorable Jagdi, uh, justice reddy made an impact in both our lives since the 1980s i was basically elevated from a pen pusher to a long serving bar town councillor until of course the councils were dissolved in 2006 by the regime which came into power following the events of December 2006 at the time i was quite hesitant to put my hand up to contest the town council elections as i had two very young boys and a busy law firm to manage for my husband however honorable justice ruddy as priscilla has said was very determined if he made up his mind we had to follow it he turned up unannounced and through um late uh, uncle uday uh, ujagar singh sorry called me into late um dr rakhas surgery during my lunch time when i got there i was totally surprised there was mr justice honorable justice ready um who was present he did not mince his word and he said i still remember what he said to me he said that we need women to come out and have a voice in the society very firmly he said that to me and as young as i was probably about 28 or something 25 um i was just to i mean like i just didn't know what to say i was the three great men who i had a lot of respect for at that time we didn't we didn't have privilege to go on facebook and i thought all we did was hear them on the radio during lectures and all that this and so i then i just didn't have anything to say and that was it i had heard words of praises about honorable justice reddy from my husband though many a time from a lawyer's perspective of course but i found him to be pleasantly firm during the meeting very intelligent and above all a charismatic person Therefore I instantly agreed because half the work was done by Adish when we was talking about honorable Reddy how he performs in court and that day I saw it for myself and there was a magic that worked and under his guidance advice and leadership we formed NFP women's wing with the very capable Mrs Chandra Reddy his good wife who always stood by him as a rock as our chairperson and like priscilla singh has already emphasized how we moved on from there subsequently we also formed gimme council of women uh, all over fiji and we partook in many other charitable religious and social organizations after that 
In those days, we did very little campaigning, as the public had so much faith on our leader, on our party, and what people spoke, because they spoke the truth. They did not manipulate people. We spoke from our heart, and we meant what we said. Um, I think uh, Richard Naidu has said, a lot of speakers have said that. And I want to specifically say here that women were more active. They really took interest in politics. They came out. But unfortunately, these days, you see women with their mobile phones going on Facebook and watching TV series. I wish they could come out and contribute because we are almost 50% of the population. And I think we are good managers, good decision makers. If we can manage our husbands, our children, home, work, we can also help them in politics. So that's my word, although I'm not contesting. <laughs> I'm not contesting. Once I became observed in the local politics, my husband Adish Narayan had the privilege of appearing in the courts of Fiji with the late Justice Ruddy. He had the benefit of seeing both sides of him, as sometimes they would be on one side and others in opposition. Adish later had the honor and privilege of appearing in his court when late Justice Reddy was the president of Court of the Appeal. Adish tells me that as a counsel and judge, late Justice Reddy was a gentleman, highly ethical, a person of integrity, and extremely knowledgeable. Adish was often awestruck with his industry and readiness for trials notwithstanding his public and political uh, commitments. Adish recalls he was meticulous with details and as an opponent was a forbidable one, forbidable one. Adish witnessed him brutally rebuke and expose a few unethical lawyers that crossed his path in court too. Our late Justice J. Ram Reddy was not only an honorable son of Fiji, a charismatic lawyer and politician, but a great statesman who earned huge respect both locally and globally. He will be greatly missed by us all. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Our love and prayers to Mrs. Reddy and family during these trying times. Thank you. Thank you, Priscilla and Anita. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Reddy convinced uh, Professor Warden Nasey to enter politics in 1996. Professor Nasey now speaks from Melbourne. Uh, hello, everyone, and greetings to all the viewers, uh, especially to Chandra and the Reddy family, uh, leader of the NFP, Professor Biman Prasad, supporters of the National Federation Party, and citizens of Fiji, you know, of all parties who admired the late Jeram Reddy. I'm, I'm really honored you know, to be asked to contribute to your memorial for the late Jeram Reddy. And I won't repeat you know, what uh, many other speakers have so eloquently said, and they will say on this great sum of Fiji. Now, I'll only speak on what uh, relationships I had with him you know, close to three years when I was in the Fiji parliament between 96 and 1999, uh, when uh, Mr. Reddy led the NFP into great partnership with Rambuka and SVT, bringing in the wonderful 97 constitution, which I believe is still alive today, not the pieces of paper called the 2013 constitution. Uh, I, I also would like to speak on what Mr. Reddy would have advised Fiji people of today, you know, as given the great lawyer that he was, the great constitutional lawyer that he was, he, what would he advise today about the massive challenges that they face, not just in piecing, putting pieces of, uh, of, of paper uh, into ballot boxes, uh, but how they can support their leaders you know, over the next uh, few months, because it's going to be a massive, massive task facing them. And what people have to do is not just put pieces of paper into ballot boxes, but do the real hard slog that's going to enable their leaders to achieve what Mr. Reddy would have liked to achieve in, achieve in Fiji. And, you know, this is a tough thing to talk about, but I will talk about it because uh, you know, the problems will only start 
once the elections are over. So let me start, first of all, by talking about my entry into parliament. Um, you know, in the 1990s, when I began writing on Fiji's constitution and electoral system, I was working together with organizations like the CCF, Constitutional Forum. I, I was critical of all the opposition parties, including the NFP. And as anyone can read in the old uh, Fiji Times articles, oh, they are there also on my blog site, Narsi on Fiji. So I was most surprised one morning to get a call from Mr. Reddy, who very sternly castigated me, said, Warden, then you know, you know, people will all know his style. You're always taking pot shots at us from in your articles from the safety and security of your USP job. Why don't you come into parliament and do something about it, you know? Something real and constructive. Now, there's a by election for the Suva constituency, and I want you to stand for NFP. Well, wow. First of all, it said something about the vision and character of Mr. Reddy that he was willing to welcome a sharp academic critic into his team. He did not want uh, yes men or yes women, you know, unlike so called, some so called government leaders of today who can't bear any critical thinking, you know, in their party. Anyway, I stood for the by election and went in unopposed by FLP, which had many of my old friends there, like Krishna Dutt. And we did work together in parliament on some things. But I never regretted it either, as, you know, in the company of Mr. Reddy and looking at his approach to Fiji's political problems, you know, it changed me as an economist forever, focusing on the bread and butter issues and community education of our people and not just publishing academic articles which no one in Fiji ever read or cared about. But I also realized that while I just sacrificed a much higher salary for only three years, Mr. J. Ram Reddy had been sacrificing his great legal career and incomes for decades. You know, all proven sacrifices, of course, you know, by the many high posts he filled internationally after leaving parliament. So it wasn't just a false sacrifice, it was a very, very genuine sacrifice. And what I do recall is that Mr. Reddy never ever talked about this uh, enormous financial sacrifice of his, you know, in, in, in our company, you know, in the Fiji parliament or outside. So, I mean, you know, what do I remember of the Fiji parliament? Well, Mr. Reddy was a most formidable, formidable speaker, you know, without any written notes. And his flowing, cutting logic, very quiet, no shouting or yelling and all that, could only be admired by opposition and government MPs alike. Perhaps uh, Mr. Rambuka was the only other one who could match him with the oratory in Parliament. <clears throat> anyway, you know, Mr. Reddy led us to do our job as an opposition party, subjecting the government to proper scrutiny, I mean, just as the Hensards will all show, if anybody wants to, to read them, just as Biman's NFP and his... Uh, members of parliament are doing in Fiji today. <clears throat> Jeram and I contributed a very solid joint parliamentary paper on how we could go forward on the expiring ELTA leases. Unfortunately, we were not able to implement all the recommendations we had. Uh, Mr. Reddy supported me as a shadow finance minister when I strongly opposed some of the disastrous decisions by the minister of finance then, Mr. Jamakoy, such as in creating the super monopoly ATH for which uh, Fiji has paid the price for, you know, 30 years now. But, you know, above all, <clears throat> I remember Mr. Jeram's readiness to sacrifice political expediency, to sacrifice votes over fairness, ethics, and spirit of cooperation that he had built up with Mr. Uh, uh, Rabuka. You know, he wasn't after votes. You know, he knew that what he was going to do was going to cost him votes. So in the run-up to the 1990 elections, I went, remember an internal NFP discussion about what strategy we should follow for the 1990 election, whether to actively compete or cooperate with Rambuka's SVT. Well, there's a strong view. Perhaps they knew the voters better than, you know, we did. Mr. Reddy's views, you know, which I fully supported, were that it was only because of the full cooperation of Rambuka in his leadership of the SVT that had enabled the Fiji parliament to peacefully move on from the biased 1990 constitution to the 1997 constitution with its multi-party cabinet provision. I mean, that was an incredible, incredible uh, uh, progressive move. But uh, sadly, our political opponents ignored the great constitutional gain that had been made, and they attacked NFP for cooperating with Rambuka. They chose political expediency over principled leadership, and sadly, you know, they won.
So I, mean, I find it uh, quite ironical that, uh, you know, there's a lesson in today. I mean, it's a very big historical irony, irony that today's leader of the NFP, Professor Deva Prasad, and his colleagues in parliament, they are facing a very similar situation for their spirit of cooperation with uh, Rabuka. Uh, yeah, Professor Prasad is a capable and solid professor of economics. You know, uh, he, he sacrificed his high-paying USP job to serve in parliament. So, you know, I'm so happy to see that Professor Prasad has an excellent slate of multiracial candidates who are all likely to make great contribution in parliament. And I see a former student in Dr. Fatiaki who is there as well. Although I'm not sure how he's going to use his uh, surgical skills, you know, against the opposition. Uh, now, I want to actually talk about something that uh, probably none of the other speakers are going to talk about, you know, which is if Mr. Jairam Reddy were around today, you know, what would he, as a sharp legal mind, what would he advise Professor Biman Prasad and his NFP team to focus on uh, following the 2022 elections? And, and I actually would like to suggest that uh, people of Fiji who are watching this, this broadcast, they also think about what their responsibility is in this whole matter, you know, and, and, and not just leave it on to the leaders after they put their pieces of paper in the ballot box. And so given the immensity of the task, I believe that all Fiji people need to give full support to Professor Prasad and NFP and Mr. Rambuka and the People's Alliance if they are succeed, to succeed in the 2022 elections, and not just that, but then reform the entire society. But then they also have to take on the full responsibility of backing their leaders after, during and after the 2022 election, because the task they're going to face even after the elections is going to be incredibly, incredibly difficult. And I, I think the the best way, you know, you can pay homage to a great leader like Mr. Jeram Reddy is to try and do what he managed to do in 1999, which was, you know, to, to bring about incredible constitutional change that had the potential for a fantastic future for Fiji people. So the, 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 the challenge is there in front of our people. And, you know, we have our great memories, of course, of, uh, of uh, Mr. Jeram Reddy. But I think, you know, you know, in, in addition to just, you know, giving him, you know, the due, due uh, homage and all that, uh, you know, through words and all that, I think the people of Fiji have to do something about it to realize his dreams. That would be the biggest compliment that our people of Fiji can pay the late Mr. Jeram Reddy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please bear with us. We have just a few more speakers, and then before we conclude uh, our, um, our, our remembrance, our memorial uh, event here today. And um, sorry, I forgot to, to thank uh, Professor Wadanasi for that contribution. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Reddy did a lot of work and had a great care and concern for Kane Gross. And uh, Mr. Jagnat Sami, who worked closely with him, will now come and pay tribute to him. Jack. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Nisambula, Namaskaram. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, leader of NFP. Uh, my job has been ma made much easier because uh, I've been specifically told to share my experience, my personal experiences uh, with, Ms. with the Justice Jairam Reddy. Justice Jairam Reddy was a son, a father, a husband, a grandfather, and the eldest sibling to his three brothers and only sister. Justice Jairam Reddy was a cane farmer, a lawyer, barrister, President of Court of Appeal, and rose to be a United Nations appointed judge at the Rwanda Human Rights Tribunal. I had the privilege of going to Arusha and spending some time with him. Justice Jairam Reddy was a senator, a parliamentarian, attorney general, and leader of the National Federation Party. But to me, he was a mentor, a philosopher, a friend, 
and family. I first met him uh, in 1986 as a legal counsel for the Fiji Sugar Milling Staff Officers Association in the matter of Nithya Reddy versus FSC for unfair and wrongful dismissal. His performance was overwhelming against Mr. Barry Sweetman, a seasoned barrister and with Munro Lees and company. He no doubt left an indelible mark on all of us. I later met him during the NFP-FLP coalition campaigns in 1987, but our relations bonded after the 1987 military coup. Not many people would want to be seen with him as the military regime was closely monitoring his movements then. I was fortunate to frequent him as I was based at FSC Drasa and he lived at Naviango. With, we spent many weeks and months talking about anything and everything, and the past, the present, and the future, and for all the people of Fiji. I learned to drink wine with him, which had become my every afternoon ritual those days. He was convinced that the solutions for Indian problems were with the Fijians, and solutions for Fijian problems were with Indians. Indians are the tenant community and Fijians are the landowners. He believed that unless the two major communities worked together, we could not find peace and stability in the nation. He was convinced that if the Fijian leader and the Indian leader work together, the Fijians and Indians will come together. Most, if not all, problems of each other would be solved. Justice Jairam Reddy was always concerned about the cane farmers. He was against anyone exploited, anyone exploiting cane farmers for political gains. He would angrily question, why should only cane farmers go on strikes? Why not others? At every political crisis, it is the cane farmers who are mobilized to go on strike. Why make the cane farmers the enemy? And true enough, when the leases started expiring in, from 1998-99, some 5,500 farmers whose leases had expired, uh, started expiring, uh, had to be resettled elsewhere. The government was helpless. The nation watched this painful human tragedy. When I was appointed General Secretary of Fiji Cane Growers Association in 1994, Justice Jairam Reddy was always there to give financial and legal support to the association. In the mid-1990s, the Fiji Cane Growers Association took the challenge to appeal the UCV declared by the Committee of Valuers and IELTA. It was Justice Jairam Reddy and Mr. B.C. Patel who offered pro bono to be the councils representing the association. The result in this successful review of the the result was the successful review of the evaluations. This meant lower rents for cane farmers. When I was appointed CEO of the Sugar Cane Growth Council in 2000, it was Justice Jairam Reddy who advised me that the council should provide legal services to the cane growers. He stated that the single most expense for cane farmers is the cost of le legal services. As per his advice, the SCGC established a legal department to provide legal services. Indeed, it was ironical that it should come from a practicing lawyer, but such was his concern for Ken Gross. After all, his father was, after all, his father was a cane grower and was displaced three times. His brothers and uncles, who were all cane growers, and he himself had a small cane farm. He understood the plight of the cane farmers very well. Justice Jairam Reddy was a kind and compassionate human being. He and Mrs. Chandra Reddy were at our home when we broke the news about our daughter Radhika's cancer diagnosis. He, <coughs> he and Mrs. Chandra Reddy were there for us <coughs> in those difficult times. He understood the pain more than anyone 
as he had lost his own son, Sanjay, <coughs> from cancer. Justice Jairam Reddy flew in from New Zealand to attend, to attend <coughs> the funeral of our daughter and provided the comfort, help, and support that we <coughs> most needed. We are forever obliged to him for being there for us. Justice Jairam Reddy was a politician who transformed himself to become a statesman. He was beyond his time. He believed that no man is evil. It is his thoughts which are evil. If you can change the thoughts of a man, he becomes a good man. Justice Jairam Reddy believed in goals and objectives and achieving those. But he believed more that if your path is a righteous one, you do not have to choose your goal you will reach your goal itself. Trust was a special place in Justice Jairam Reddy's life. I vividly recall the meeting held at the NFP parliamentary office after the enactment of the 97 constitution. Every executive member around the table was asked to give their opinion on the NFP SBT coalition proposal. Almost all members felt the coalition could have negative impact on the general elections. Justice Jairam Reddy spoke the last and said, I have worked with Rambuka and we were able to get the constitution passed unanimously. He said, having done the constitution, if I dump, if I dump him now, the Fijian community will never trust another Indian leader. Trust is not something one can buy from the market. Trust is something to be built and nurtured. Elections can be won and lost but trust once lost is forever lost. Indeed, after he spoke, the decision to go into coalition was endorsed by the executives unanimously. Such was the power of influence and vision for the people of Fiji he held. Thus, this sums up the man and his life. The man I always will adore and respect. He will remain my mentor forever. May his soul find eternal peace. Kanta, my wife, and I join all of you and thousands of all over the world in expressing our deep, deepest condolences to Mrs. Chandra, daughters Helen Sandhya, son Prashant, and the Reddy brothers Janardhan, Sharda, Raghuram, and their families. May God bless them all. Thank you. The Fiji Trade Union Congress National Assistant Secretary, former NSP General Secretary and former leader, Mr. Atar Singh, was one of the many talents identified by Mr. Reddy. I now invite Atar to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Mrs. Reddy, I'm told that you're watching the family Mr. Reddy's brothers, their families and children, the leader of the party, president of the party, ladies and gentlemen. I, as have been introduced, I'm, I'm a unionist. And unfortunately, I'll not be able to speak uh, or say many things that I would like to say, as some of the speakers previously have said, because I'm constrained by Mr. Kayum's law that as a unionist, I cannot be seen to be campaigning for a political party or political cause. But I will, will let you know, talk to you about my, my close association with Mr. Reddy. I was a Labour Party person until after 1987. In the 1987 election campaigns, for the first time, I saw Mr. Reddy speak as the coalition was campaigning for the 87 elections. And I saw him speak, I heard him speak at the Sangam, TSI Sangam Hall at the, at the, in Bellow Street in Suva. And from that day, I knew that this man had a gift. And that was that he could speak eloquently, without a sheet of paper, that he believed in not just moving one community forward, which was his community, that he wanted 
the whole country to be able to move forward together. He believed in multiracialism. He believed in cross cooperation. When I decided to leave the Labour Party, I know some people here will be hearing this for the first time. It was in 1991, when the 92 elections were called. And at the time, you'll recall that the parties of the coalition had decided or were deciding whether to contest under the 1990 um, racial or biased constitution imposed by Mr. Rambuka after his coup. But as a unionist also at the time, I was very clear that if we, we wanted our worker concerns, worker rights to be restored, then we needed to participate. And I heard that from only one leader, and that was Mr. Reddy. I, together with my union colleagues, James Raman, the one Shankar at the time, with the academic late Mr. Simeon Endurtalo, may his soul rest in peace, and Emma Drovesi, Sister Emma Drovesi, a women's rights advocate within the union movement, we left the walked out of the Labour Party together. Because we believed that NFP was going to better, better serve the interests of the workers than the Labour Party would. And thereafter, of course, I joined my friend and colleague James Raman, who later on became, went on to become a member of parliament for Suva constituency on his campaign for the 92 elections. Mr. Reddy and Mr. Y.P. Reddy, who was chairman of the party at the time, approached me to be a candidate for the 1992 elections for the Lambasa constituency. I was honored that I was recognized to be capable enough to, to, to contest, but of course I declined that. I campaigned for James Raman, and my intention wasn't to contest elections. I campaigned in 92 elections as branch secretary for Suva, and then thereafter, as Mr. Dosa Minaidu has said, the SNAP elections, as we know it, called in 1994. And after 1994 elections is when Mr. Reddy himself felt empowered. Because previous to that, you'll recall, the opposition was split 13-12 on 27 seats. And after, after the 1994 elections, NFP obtained 20 seats, became the larger party in the opposition in there, and Mr. Reddy's seat as the opposition leader confirmed. And that's when the real discussions on the review of the 1990 constitution started. Serious discussions started then. You should know that in 1992, these days people talk about manifesto, election manifesto. What are you going to offer and what are you going to talk about? What are you going to change? The 1992 elections were fought on but one single issue, and there was to change the 1990 constitution. None other. Many in the election campaign asked on other issues. And as Priscilla has pointed out earlier, Mr. Reddy believed that if you have the right constitutional and legal framework in place, everything else will flow from it. And we all know everything else does. Whether it's your social rights, your economic rights, all flows from it. But we have parts of the population suppressed or oppressed. You can't be a, have a country working together in the same direction. And that was what Mr. Reddy wanted to do. He came to Parliament 
with one single goal and he achieved it in 1997. And of course that journey, many have spoken about already, was a very difficult one. I remained the branch secretary until around 1997. I attended the 1997 conference of the party in Rikiriki. And while I was, as a younger person of the party, out in the back somewhere around the grog bowl, having a yarn in Talanoa, I heard a voice call for me from the, from the podium. And I wasn't sure if my name was being called. And someone said, hey, you are being called. It was Mr. Reddy calling me to accept the position of the party's general secretary. Mr. Reddy was a man that I could hardly discuss anything with because I held him in such high regard, with such respect, I couldn't question him. If I was to suggest anything, it had to be done very calmly in a, in a, at a time when he was in, a, in the right mood. Our age gap is vast. So I couldn't say no to him. And I accepted that position. And I was suddenly on the national stage, working for the party. And of course, everyone knows, after 97 constitution, the 1990 elections followed, and we got decimated. And Wadhan has spoken about it, others have spoken about it. That how unfortunate, how unfortunate it was that our people couldn't understand that that 97 constitution as a, as a document. It wasn't just a book. It wasn't just, just things written between two, two covers. It was that that was going to deliver cooperation, multiracialism, and the rights that people wanted. When the elections ended, our management board met. And Mr. Reddy attended that meeting. We, of course, the party was no longer in parliament. We didn't have a single seat in parliament. So we had to quickly find an office to operate from as a party. And thanks to Mr. Y.P. Reddy, he gave us a, a small place in Moala Street in Samabula, in an industrial area in Samabula, where nobody would expect a political party to be. We moved there. And that was Mr. Reddy's last meeting of the party. He told us he has been rejected, it's time for him to move on. But thereafter, I yearned for his counsel and advice. I mean, with him gone, all our other parliamentarians and others also have been lost elections. Chacha Jaginder Singh and I were left to run the party as Chacha Jaginder Singh as president and me as secretary. And by default, the leadership of the party fell on me. Absolutely by default. Mr. Reddy told me that, Atar, we have an office that, that we are now occupied will of course need staff, secretariat to run the, run the place. But he said, please make sure there are funds left over from the election, election campaign, that those funds are not used for paying staff. I think we owe it to the previous generations of the, of the party, the founders of the party and supporters, that we do something else. Firstly, you, your job is to keep the party alive. Now, hell, I mean, it's a hell of a task when you don't have a single member in parliament who can talk about your policies and approach. And the second thing was to use the remainder of the funds to buy a property after 99. And in 2000, we, Chacha Jaginder Singh and I, 
with the assistance of Mr. Vinod Patel, who just left, Mr. Y.P. Reddy, we went out looking and found the current location of the party at Tamabua. And it was from that, part, that office that we kept running the party. There's a very difficult time, very difficult journey, because when you don't have anyone in parliament, and then thereafter, we didn't have anyone in parliament after 2001 elections. We didn't have anyone in parliament after 2006 either. So times were difficult. After 2001, we had one Mr. Prem Singh. So contributions were hard to come because we had become a nothing to a negligible party. But our job, and whenever I spoke to him as a friend, he kept saying, you got to keep this going. No matter how hard it is, how difficult it is, how difficult it may be to get money, to get funding, to get support, how difficult, how difficult it may be to get people to attend your meetings, how disappointed you may be with the audience you know, that, that attends your meetings. But you got to carry on. Because the values of the NFP, he said, was what was important. And I carried on. I carried on with the assistant Jaginder Singh and others. There are people here, they were Naidu from Ba. Some people have passed on. The branches in Singatoka, Lambasa, Pramod Chan, and others. And Jagannath Sami. We carried on and kept running the party. Mr. Reddy, as Jack said, was questioned by the party about his decision to enter into a coalition with Mr. Rabuka for 99. And after hearing everybody, he said, that's the man I worked with, that's the man that has helped us deliver the 97 constitution, that's the man that arranged his, Mr. Reddy's access to the Great Council of Chiefs meeting and that he has spoken to the Great Council of Chiefs assuring them there is a community that they weren't here to you, sir, that this was their home. So after doing all that, how can he, as the leader of the party, give that up suddenly and abandon Rambuka and then face him in election as, as adversary? You couldn't. And he said, we will therefore either swim or sink. Of course, sink is what happened. Mr. Rambuka also didn't fare very well. Both communities rejected the leaders that worked together to deliver the constitutional document. A very sad day, very sad. Mr. Reddy was obviously very disappointed by what happened. But he he harbored hope that one day the country will return, that one day the people will rethink what they've done. And he continued to talk to us. Of course, thereafter, he moved on to positions from which he could not talk to us very openly and, and otherwise. He moved on to judicial appointments. Um, but whenever he could, we could meet, we would have a bowl of grog and have a chat. Mr. Reddy has left us a legacy that I don't see anybody else being able to peddle. He's a man of courage, conviction, an honest, sincere man, loyal to the people and loyal to his beliefs. Whether he worked for the farmers, or he worked for anybody else. He did that with utmost sincerity, and Jack has talked about that. He did say that you might talk to farmers, cane farmers, and they might, don't think, don't you ever think they're all voting for you? But don't give up. It was him who was instrumental in the formation of the Fiji Cane Growers Association as a 
organization of the of the farmers it was fcga thereafter the 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 organ that was used for elections for the shogun growers council and eventually took jagannath sami to the position of ceo of the growers council now many things have changed since all changed by decree mr reddy was also a friend of the labor movement as other leaders of the nfp also were and i recall my discussions with him when mr jima koe moved and proposed corporatization of of public utilities fea and of course the ath episode we are all aware of and he agreed with us that perhaps we are not ready for corporatization at that time and he made that known workers and unions had a issue about bargaining and trade union rights he supported in the approval of the trade union recognition act he supported our our cause workers cause for reasonable redundancy payments in the event of any redundancies arising out of any of the corporatization or privatization because he said if people are suddenly thrown out of work for no fault of their own then they ought to be able to find another means of living and that while they do so they should be able to support themselves and their family i also had the privilege of traveling with mr reddy around fiji and i recall after 1997 when the leases began to expire at many meetings he would say the leases belong to the ethoke people of the country you are leasing it understand that and he knew it 30 years ago that it's going to going to come to come to expire what kind of relationship have you built with your landlord or with the, with your madangali over this time and at least in one meeting i went with him to meet the twin andongo in bonvalevu i think friends we are today mourning and also celebrating a great life someone who has who has given his all to the country and i think it's time that our leaders of the future came out to emulate leaders like him maybe it is this time some people have are saying i just want you to also know that both mr rambuka and mr professor prasad also spoke at the ftuc meeting earlier today and they were grilled i say but mr reddy has left a lot for us to learn from and left a lot for us to do as others have said if we were to achieve one day what his dreams were there'd be no better way to remember him thank you thank you atar uh, ladies and gentlemen i now um, welcome to the stage uh, the leader of the national federation party professor biman prasad thank you ladies and gentlemen let me say that the late uh, justice jairam reddy had thousands and thousands of admirers and those who revered him and that is why you can see today that we have had so many people talking about the late justice jairam reddy 
There are many others who wanted to speak, but we already had a long list of speakers. On 5th November 2015, in the same hall, Honorable Justice J. Ram Reddy, while paying tribute to Vishwanathan, a friend and NFP stalwart, as well as the party's general secretary at that time, during re-registration as a political party in 2013, said the following, and I quote, one, sh one should salute and honor a man like Vishwa and not mourn his death. Death is an absolute necessity of life. If it wasn't, then dictators, tyrants, and despots will continue to live forever. Nothing is permanent in life because life itself is not permanent." Unquote. Last week, we said our final goodbyes in Auckland, New Zealand to Mr. J. Ram Reddy. A man who deeply cared about Fiji, his people, and his future well-being. But Mr. Reddy was a man of this country, Fiji, and this city of Lotoka. And we in the National Federation Party knew that we must also have this memorial to Mr. Reddy in his place of birth and the place where he lived much of his public and private life. Therefore, in keeping with Justice Reddy's philosophy, it is indeed our honor to, it is our duty and honor to recall his momentous and enormous contribution to our country. He was a man like no other. We all know that Mr. Reddy was a leader and a statesman. His vision and wisdom set the court course not just for our party, but for all our people of Fiji. And yet, my friends, he achieved this without holding political power in government. He spent almost all his political life in opposition. He achieved this because of the power of his intellect, his foresightedness and his deep understanding of human beings. Since Mr. Reddy's death, many people have circulated and reminded us of Mr. Reddy's historic speech to the Boselevu Vakaturanga in 1997. He went there because Mr. Rambuka invited him. This encounter was historic because never before had an Indo-Fijian leader met formally to engage with the traditional leaders of the Turkey, and once again, Mr. Reddy has always spoke to advise and persuade. And as Mr. Rambuka has told us, Mr. Reddy once again succeeded. I want to, just for record, again review some of the historic words Mr. Reddy spoke. Those carefully considered words came at a time when our two major communities were once again reaching out to each other, looking for solutions to the hurt and trauma of the past. Mr. Eddie addressed the chiefs of Fiji directly. He asked that they consider themselves leaders, not just of the Toke, but all of Fiji's people. He reminded them that Indo-Fijians did not wish to separate themselves from the Itoke brothers and sisters. And speaking for the Indo-Fijian community, this is what he told them. Fiji is our home. Fiji is our only home. We have no other. We want no other." Unquote. And then Mr. Reddy talked about security. He talked frankly about how all of us in Fiji felt. He talked about fear. He talked about division, and he talked about how this must end. And this is how he addressed himself to the members of the Great Council of Chiefs, and I quote again, we seek not to threaten your security, but to protect it. For in your security lies the basis 
of our own, unquote. We must, ladies and gentlemen, stop and reflect carefully on those words spoken about 25 years ago. 25 years ago. This was the vision and wisdom of this man. What was Mr. Reddy telling us? He was telling us that the way forward is partnership, deep, meaningful partnership between our communities, recognizing our differences, working together to build the way forward is partnership. Working together to build those strengths, working together to build other strengths, working together, helping each other where we are not so strong. This is the unified leadership Fiji wants. This is the dignified cooperative leadership Fiji wants. My friends, Mr. Reddy fought for all of us. He used his unique, outstanding gifts, his wisdom and intellect, his vision, his power to reason, and his power to persuade. Mr. Reddy had the power to forgive without forgetting. He had the power to understand that if Fiji was to have a brighter future, it could not stay tethered to an unhappy past. In doing so, Mr. Reddy showed then his political maturity and unparalleled wisdom. He showed it took more than courage and conviction, indeed vision for a harmonious Fiji, which was at that time, and still is, eluding many who are far more interested in personal advancement than national interest. But there again lies the hallmark of a person when the chips are down, that's when a sterling character rises above the perfidies of deceitful politics of grabbing power at any cost. And Mr. Reddy did just that. He stuck to his principles because that was, is, and will be the only way forward for a lasting, harmonious nation that truly becomes a land of hope and opportunity for all its people. This is the enduring mark of this great man. This is the legacy Mr. Reddy has left us. And this is why, as many have said, he will never be forgotten. My friends, we are already in an election campaign. And already there are certain politicians who go to places of worship where they think they are out of sight. They quietly, they quietly tell people that only one party can guarantee people's security. They encourage people to fear leaders of other political parties. And this is the politics that the late Justice Jeram Reddy would never, would never condone and which Mr. Reddy would never accept. The politics of fear, small-mindedness. Politics which seeks to buy people's votes. Politics which does not advise, does not persuade, does not use reason or logic. Politics which plays on people's fears. And as our election campaign rolls out, I ask all of us to remember what I have said, to remember and to ask ourselves, which of our leaders are true to Mr. Reddy's vision? Which leaders look forward, look to deepen understanding and democracy? And which leaders instead want to cling to power? And which leaders will do and say whatever they need just to keep themselves in power? In 1997, Mr. Reddy's finest hour, or in his finest hour, Fiji was at a critical point. 
We are now, ladies and gentlemen, at another one. In this election, our very democracy is on the line. We have seen the way the Fiji First government behaves. We are a country that is once again divided, fearful and desperate for new leadership. I say to all of you and to all of us that Mr. Jairam Reddy's life is a beacon for us to meet the great challenges of bringing back Fiji, those dear things that he always stood up for and fought for, for democracy, rule of law, decency, and above all, respect for one another. Mr. Reddy's party, NFP, has come together with Mr. Rambuka's party. We owe it to Mr. Reddy. We really owe it to Mr. Reddy to continue his vision and his ambition for Fiji. 23 years ago, before the 1999 elections, Mr. Reddy said, and I quote, we face the most momentous elections in our history. The choices we make and the steps we take individually and collectively will determine the kind of society we bequeath to the next generation, unquote. We may have failed in 99, but like Mr. Rambuka, I want to assure the people of Fiji that this time we will succeed because failure is not an option. We owe it to Justice Jairam Reddy and his indestructible, indestructible vision for Fiji. We owe it to a giant amongst Fiji's leaders who played an indelible part in shaping NFP into an impregnable fortress. We owe it to one of Fiji's finest statesmen who told his political detractors in March 1998 that his conscience is clean and is only answerable to his creator. And right here in Lotoka, ladies and gentlemen, the birthplace of Jairam Reddy, the NFP pays homage to him and salutes a loyal and true son of Fiji. I want to thank all of you for coming to honor Mr. Reddy's memory. I ask you all to return home and reflect deeply on Mr. Reddy's life, his sacrifices, and his vision for Fiji. My friends, I just want to, before I conclude, say a few words in Hindi, because Mr. Reddy was both a brilliant, eloquent speaker, not only in English, but also in Hindi. And one day, after listening to his speech, I asked him, I said, Mr. Reddy, how did you, where did you learn such good Hindi? Or how did you come to speak such good Hindi? And so eloquently, and so poetically, and he said, you know, he smiled and said, Biman, you know, I, when I got into politics, I realized that I had to speak in Hindi in most places. And he said, I, I decided that there was a good idea to watch old Hindi movies. <laughs> and that's where he was able to speak that kind of Hindi. So I just want to honor him and say a few words in Hindi with your permission. Bhaiyon aur bahenon, main Oakland mein Shri Reddy ke antim sanskar mein bhaag liya tha aur wahan maine bahut hi सुंदर शब्दों में अन्य लोग जो वहाँ पर बात किए थे विशेषकर श्री रेड्डी के पारिवारिक गण उनकी बेटी हेलन 
और उनकी दूसरी बेटी संध्या दोनों बहुत ही सुंदर शब्दों में बहुत ही बारीकी से श्री रेड्डी की जो जीवन थी पारिवारिक जीवन रिश्तेदारों के साथ उनकी जो प्रतिक्रिया थी जो व्यवहार था उसके बारे में उन्होंने बहुत ही सुंदर ढंग से कहा और मैं उनको विशेष धन्यवाद देना चाहता हूँ मैं राजनीति में श्री रेड्डी के कहने पर आया 99 में मैं उससे पूर्व थोड़े समय पीएचडी करके ऑस्ट्रेलिया से आया था और उन्होंने मुझे मुझसे मांग किया कि मैं 99 में चुनाव लड़ूं और मैं बिना किसी हिचकिचाहट के उनसे कह दिया कि अगर आप कहते हो तो मुझे आना पड़ेगा भाइयों और बहनों कैसे मैं उनसे ये कह सकता था कि मैं नहीं चाहता हूं क्योंकि मुझे पता था उस समय वो साठ बरस से ज्यादा हो गए थे और मुझे पता था कि वो एक फिजी के सबसे बड़े धुरंधर लॉयर थे जो मिलिनिया बन सकते थे जिन जो पैसा बहुत कमा सकते थे लेकिन उन्होंने सभी कुछ त्याग करके और हमारे लोगों के लिए हमारे देश के लिए सभी कुछ त्याग कर और राजनीति में 25 सालों से ज़्यादा थे ऐसा त्याग ऐसा दृष्टि वाले लीडर जैसे बहुत सारे लोगों ने हमें कहा है कि शायद फिर हमें देखने को नहीं मिलेगा सुनने को नहीं मिलेगा उनकी जो दृष्टि थी उनकी विजन भविष्य के लिए वो 1999 में या उससे पहले शुरू किया था और आज भी आज भी उसकी जो दृष्टि है उसकी जो विजन है उसको हम एक बार फिर साकार बना सकते हैं उसको परिपूर्ण कर सकते हैं और शायद ये आने वाली जो आम चुनाव है ये बहुत ही बड़ी चुनौती है हमारे लोगों के लिए हमारे देश के लिए और श्री रेड्डी की जो दृष्टि थी जो विजन थी उसको बनाने के लिए तो एक बार फिर मैं आप सभी को मैं जानता हूं आज का जो प्रोग्राम है बहुत लंबा था क्योंकि बहुत हजारों लोग श्री रेड्डी के मानते थे जानते थे बहुत और लोग आज बात करना चाहते थे यहाँ पर लेकिन विशेष हम उन लोगों को चुने थे जो करीबी से श्री रेड्डी के साथ थे तो मैं हमारे पार्टी के तरफ से आप सभी के तरफ से एक बार फिर श्री रेड्डी के सभी परिवार को अपना सहानुभूति पहुंचाते हैं और परमपिता परमेश्वर से यही प्रार्थना करते हैं कि उनकी आत्मा को सदैव शांति और सदगति प्रदान करें God bless you all ladies and gentlemen and God bless Fiji Thank you uh, very much leader Ladies and gentlemen I I I thank you for your patience and uh, we've come to the to our last speaker this afternoon and uh, she is uh, Dr Padma Nasilal Dr. Padma and uh, Professor Bridgelal were very good friends of uh, Mr. Reddy. She now joins us from uh, Brisbane. Thank you. When I was first asked to record a tribute for Jay, my initial reaction or instinct was to say no. 
not because he didn't have my highest admiration and respect, but because of the emotional challenges facing me as I lost Bridge in December 2021. Bridge and Jay were close. One of Bridge's proudest books was his 20th 10th biographical work, In the Eye of the Storm, Jairam Reddy and the Politics of Post-Colonial Fiji. Bridge also could not forget the trust Jay had bestowed on him when he was appointed to, the, to be the representative of the Indo-Fijian community on the Fiji Constitutional Review Commission, and whose report led to, to the widely praised but now abrogated 1997 constitution. I have many fond memories of Bridge and I discussing Fiji with both Jay and Chandra and discussing Jay's broad impact on Fiji with Bridge. Knowing of Fiji's, uh, knowing of Jay's failing health, Bridge had already written a tribute before his passing, just in case his own failing eyesight would continue to deteriorate. We hadn't even thought that Bridge, in fact, could not be here himself when Jay left this world. Bridge was in regular contact with Jay and Chandra. After Bridge passed away, Chandra and Jay sent their sincere condolences and felt my pain. Sadly, now Chandra and I understand each other's loss. So much has already been written about Jay, Mr. Jay Ram Reddy, the leader of our National Federation Party, the president of the Fiji Court of Appeal, the judge in the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, and a proud defender of democracy and governance in Fiji. To Bridge and I, he was not only all of these things, but a good friend, a point of admiration we shared about Jay, above his deep integrity and sincerity of purpose was his intolerance of fools and his delightful short fuse when disagreeing with egocentric people, promoting self instead of service. But he always showed utmost respect and sincerity to the many ordinary people around him. Jay always had time to listen to ideas and suggestions from men and women from all walks of life, regardless of their educational status, political leanings or cultural backgrounds. While Jay, as Bridge had written in the eye of the storm, was confident in his own abilities and unafraid of intellectual arguments and debates. I remember, remember he also demanded action and not just comments and words of criticism. Jay would strongly encourage people who may have expressed disdain for the conventional loyalty of politics along racial lines to join him in addressing and resolving the problems facing Fiji. He urged us all not to just be bystanders. I met Jay and Chandra in Lotoko in the 1980s. As many of you may remember, it was a time when gender roles were traditional. Men in one corner talking politics and world affairs, women in another sharing stories about kids and gossip. Having a genuine interest in politics, I would often wander into the male corner, sitting down to listen. While frowned upon by some, Jay would always welcome my presence and listen to my ideas. This, I realized, was not just because I was Bridget's wife, but because of his innate sense of egalitarianism and respect. This remained the case over time as Jay would often welcome many community workers, professionals, small businesses, trade unionists, academics, regardless of gender, into the National Federation Party, providing them with a platform to share their views and ideas and even give them NFP tickets to stand. While we all are continuing the fight to realize a collective vision for a better Fiji, there are many lessons and ideas, insights, inspirations we can all gather from the new dawn Jay had dreamt of. Jay, your legacy of respect, equality and inclusiveness lives on and will continue to inspire us all to embrace the principles of democracy, 
ethics, honesty, integrity, accountability, good governance and transparency to witness the new dawn for a better Fiji. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have come to the conclusion of our of our memorial uh, event here today for the late Justice J. Ramredi. And uh, before we part our ways to, to go back home, I would like to, at this stage, uh, um, take a very sh short moment of your time to, um, to thank uh, a few people, particularly those that, that have put this event together to remember such a great man that we have come to honor here today. First of all, I would like to uh, thank all our speakers here today, uh, from uh, the leader of the People's Alliance Party all the way to Mrs. Padma Lal this afternoon. Uh, we, have, we have heard so many tributes, and um, they've all spoken so well and passionately about the men the men that they all came to love and know. And I'm sure it is for us to go back and learn from the lessons that we have heard today and, um, and take them, particularly at this time, because we need the inspirations of people like the late um, Justice J. Ramredi. We need to be inspired or be inspired by him, particularly for the kind of experiences that we are you know, going through today in Fiji and at this important time when we take our turn now for the next four years to choose our new government. So we thank all of our speakers, particularly for everything that they've shared with us today on the life of the late Justice Jerem Reddy. And I would like to thank the, the family of the um, of Justice uh, Jerem Reddy uh, who are here or who are with us here today. I thank everyone uh, all of you that have come from near and afar to uh, join us on this um, very important occasion and to, um, um, to witness you know, some great statements from very fine people about what Justice Jerem Reddy meant to them, and not only to them, but what he has done for Fiji and all of our people. And uh, Last but not least, I would like to thank the organizers of this event, the National Federation Party. I'm not going to name anyone in particular, but I thank the party for keeping the memory of Justice J. Ram Reddy alive. The memory of a person of deep integrity, of sincerity, of someone who has sacrificed his all for Fiji. A sacrifice that he saw that Fiji can only progress forward in security together through inclusiveness. And I hope we can all go back here today and leave those principles and, and treasure them as our own as we live in our communities and make this country a better country for all to live. And with those few words, I would like to say, Vinabalebu, thank you, Danabat, for coming this afternoon, and we wish you all a safety back to your homes. Thank you.